This lesson is going to cover the Gothic era in Europe. Primarily we'll be talking about France, and France is expanding during this time period, really beginning in about the 12th century. All the little colored sections that you see on the map are areas that uh, France expanded into during this time period. We'll also be looking at a little bit of Italian art, as well as a cathedral in the British Isles. So let's talk about a few of the points that we'll be looking at in this uh, lesson. Now the term Gothic was originally an insult. Um, first it was called the French style, and the period was renamed by an art historian in the 16th century, sort of as a derogatory term. Um, as this style was said to be led by these invaders who destroyed classical civilization. Now in the 16th century there was a return to classical style that we saw with the Greeks. But now we see the Gothic era as a really important period in architectural development as well as in art. It's known as the Age of Cathedrals and that's primarily what we'll be looking at. Architectural sculpted figures appear more natural now as we get away, of the, away from the stiffness of the Byzantine and the medieval time period. We have flying buttresses, pointed arches, stained glass windows, and ribbed vaults that help to make these cathedrals possible. Under Louis IX, Paris became the artistic capital of Europe and a major center of book production. Let's talk a little bit about Gothic style. Beginning around the year 1100, a style of building developed in which massive cathedrals were built with the emphasis on upward thrust and light. One of the main visionaries of this style was a man known as Abbot Suger. It looks like sugar, but it's Suger. Now, Abbot Suger believed in the symbolic transformational power of light, which he called Lux Nova, or New Light. He also believed in expressing the glory of God with gold and jewels. Now, of course, this later becomes pretty controversial, but he believed that God was glory, God was this um, wealth beyond measure, so he would want his abbots and the upper, uh, the people that held the most power in his church, to have fine jewels and gold and all the trappings that went with a wealthy lifestyle. So this is his chalice, his cup above, and it is set with sacred stones, with stones that were very rare at the time. This is the period, the time period, uh, that many of the Gothic cathedrals were built, and one of the prime inspirations for this was the Abbot Suger, who believed in the power, transformational power of light. So when you wanted, when you walked into these cathedrals, your first experience would be a flood of light. And Suger believed that the Christian experience uh, was really supported by this brilliant divine colored light to hit the worshipers as they entered the church. Now when you look at the building on the right, the interior, note that the little arches are the size, they are uh, probably 10 or 12 feet high. So you can imagine little bitty people in this very tall building. So <clears throat> he believed that these stained glass windows, which really came to prominence in this era, would help to create a multicolored gem-like effect. Suger wrote that he wanted the whole church to shine with an uninterrupted light of most sacred windows, pervading the interior with beauty. His ideas for sacred buildings also helped to elevate the status of France, and it encouraged a great building boom in which each architect endeavored to make his cathedral soar higher, thus taking the faithful ever closer to God. Now, as we shall see in the films and in some of the, when you look at the cathedrals, often they were built over a period of 100, 200, even longer years. And what happened also, often is that as they were attempting to go higher and higher with these structures, well, they would collapse. So let's discuss some of the basic characteristics of Gothic architecture. We have pointed arches, which allow for more light.
And then there's something called flying buttresses, which you'll see in the films this week. And these stabilized the tall walls of the naves. They were basically external structures to balance the weight of the ceilings. There's something called ribbed vaults, which allowed for walls to be filled with glass rather than with stone to support the structure. Stained glass in these Gothic churches transmitted colored light through these skeletal walls, so the interior space was unified and unbroken. The thick Romanesque pillars that we saw in the last era were replaced with thin clustered piers and columns. Large rose, winter, uh, large rose windows were often the centerpieces at the entrance. And then we have height. A vertical emphasis was truly everywhere during this period. So let's take a look at how they actually did it. And I'll say that the black and white picture above is the interior of uh, Saint Denis, the church that was first built by Abbot Suget. The two interior examples show the technique called ribbed arches and groin vaults. These are also called cross vaults, and we're going to look at a slide that shows this a little more clearly in the next image. Ribbed arches refer to the ribs that are visible in these examples, and the groin vaults are the same process that was developed by the Romans to build the large buildings that they had as their forums. Now what these groin vaults did was they allowed as much light to enter the buildings as was possible. Now we're looking at flying buttresses on the right, and this was an important building tool that helped them to achieve ever higher uh, elevations with the church ceilings. You can see here how there's the flying buttress would actually be that structure on the right of this of the image on the right, and what it is is it's a pier that adds a weight to sort of counteract the weight of the roof as it's pressing down on these very high walls. So basically with the ribbed vaults what we have is the pointed arches around the side but then we also have an arch that goes across from one corner to the other across the very center of the structure. So you see there's the arches on the outside and then there's the supporting arches that go across the middle of the structure and actually allow it to be supported without having a large post in the middle. This was very important for the development of goth Gothic architecture. Let's just now talk a little bit about the sculpture. These are images from Chartres Cathedral, and we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go forward. But let's just look at, the thou at some of the thousands of stone sculptures that were created by anonymous architects in order to decorate these cathedrals. Here's a detail. Looks like there's a little bit of hell happening there on the right and some Jesus action on the left. So think about that these were way up tall. You didn't really see them unless you got up close to them. And yet still, they're elaborately carved with such incredible detail to tell a story and to support the church overall. One of the main features of the Gothic cathedrals <clears throat> was the stained glass windows. And this is Scenes from Genesis, which is from the Cathedral of Notre Dame, also known as Chartres in Paris. Now, if you can see this, if you look closely, it's also in your book, you can see that it's actually scenes from Genesis. We have Adam and Eve, and then we have the story of the Good Samaritan with Jesus. Now, with this image, there's a, a parallel being drawn between Jesus helping the Good Samaritan and God helping Adam and Eve. So you can see that these windows were used to teach stories as well as they were to bring illumination. It's easy to imagine that the people at the time lived actually pretty difficult lives. There wasn't a lot of bright color in their lives. But then they would go into these churches and see these brightly colored illuminations and it must have had a very, very powerful effect. Here's another example of the storytelling aspect, which is the flight into Egypt. And you can see here how the forms are really simplified, but it tells a clear story. A big feature of the cathedrals is what we call the rose windows. And this is the basic format for rose windows that are still created today. In fact, I've worked on some rose windows because they, in general, stained glass tends to sort of 
do what they call slumping. In other words, the supports that hold the glass in place can become weakened through time, and so they often need to be re-supported and re-leaded. So that's something that art conservators do in order to keep them up. But the effect of these large rose windows is just magnificent. It really brings the mi to mind the presence of some kind of a divine, of a divinity, just by the very nature of the light. So here we have the cathedral at Notre Dame, Paris, also known as Chartres Cathedral. This was begun in the mid-12th century and went into the mid-13th century. They even added a north spire in the 16th century. Chart is seen as a beautiful example of the Gothic style <clears throat> and within it we see early experimentation that was the architecture at the beginning as it develops into a more mature Gothic style with the later additions to the cathedral. Chartres is interesting in that it was originally a town that was dedicated to a goddess cult, pre-Christian. And, as they were known to do, the Christians came in and dedicated it instead to Virgin Mary. And their relic that people came to see from far and wide was supposedly a piece of linen that Mary had worn at the birth of Christ. Now, this cathedral is best known for the West, well, this cathedral is known for many things, for its stained glass, for the sculptural work that we've seen already on the outside, and in particular, the West Facade is a beautiful example of relief sculpture of the period. Here we have the West Side of the Cathedral at the level of the doors, and let's look at a little bit of the detail of this. And so we can see the elaborate sculpture. It's almost too much sculpture to take in. And as a, a bit of art criticism, that would be something I would say, is it's so elaborate, it's really hard to see. You could take any one of these sculptures and it would stand alone as a beautiful work of art. And as they're all put together in this sort of composition, it is a lot to take in and a lot to, to even to be able to view. In order to build these cathedrals, armies, basically, of skilled artisans and craftspeople were employed. And these cathedrals were funded by actually taxing the local people. We've seen, we see many instances of the local people actually rising up against the bishops, as the Catholic Church had quite a lot of power, and the local, more the poor people, didn't have a lot of say in how they were taxed. But you can see in this image, you see the wheel. They would use pulleys and wheels in order to raise extremely heavy loads up to the ceiling of the cathedral. Master architects were employed to figure out how to get ever higher and higher with the ceilings. And then there was the artisans for the stained glass that were very skilled. And then there was the artisans that were the sculptors who created all the sculpture. So each of the cathedrals maybe took a hundred years to build, sometimes more, sometimes less, and they were all created by literally hundreds of artisans that used their skill in support of the buildings. So here we have the Cathedral at Rheims, which looks pretty much the same, although I want you to notice that it was begun in 1211, um, left unfinished in 1311, with original work that was done from for about 22 years in the early 1400s. So it gives you an idea of the time span that was necessary to create these massive structures. And you'll see also in the films that they were often located in the middle of agricultural areas. So you would have very low houses and then these massive structures literally rising hundreds of feet above the plain. Very impressive. And here, more sculpture, and this is the west facade of Rheim Cathedral. Can you imagine walking into this interior uh, on a cold day, and you coming in and seeing it just filled with this light, and hearing the choir singing? Well, that was the experience of many of the pilgrims and the people who visited this church in its day. One of the interesting features of the cathedrals is that they're often still used as churches. So they're still places of worship here almost a thousand years after they were built. This completes part one of our presentation and part two will be coming up next.